Hi, I'm Jared Gardner, and this is the first video of a series that I'm going to do about melanocytic dermatopathology. A lot of people have asked me for videos about nevi and melanoma, and I've kind of put this off for quite a while for a few reasons. Number one, it's a huge daunting task because there are so many different types of melanocytic lesions. And there's some different uh, opinions about how to interpret these lesions and some controversies surrounding that. So I'm going to do my best to, um, to use this as an introductory primer, uh, a starting point uh, for you to, to uh, understand how I diagnose melanocytic lesions in my practice. And obviously whole textbooks have been written on this topic and so there's a lot more education that you can do about this. And I continue to, to learn more about this topic on a regular basis. So let me start with a few disclaimers first. Um, first of all, melanocytic lesions are common. We see them in dermatopathology practice many times daily. And deciding between a benign melanocytic nevus and a malignant melanoma is one of the most important skills for a dermatopathologist to have. And uh, there are a lot of reasons for that, but a couple of the big ones are that if you miss a diagnosis of melanoma, it could potentially harm a patient. Uh, and also, it's a, a common reason in the United States, at least, for medical malpractice lawsuits, a misdiagnosis of melanoma. So all pathologists who look at skin are always worried about missing uh, a melanoma. They don't want to miss melanoma, which is good. That's an appropriate fear to have, I think. But at the same time, we don't want that fear to cause us excess anxiety when looking at melanocytic lesions or to overdiagnose things um, as more atypical than they actually are or calling uh, benign nevi that are unusual uh, malignant. We don't want to, to do that because that also causes harm for the patient. The patient gets labeled with a diagnosis of melanoma. They feel afraid. They may get uh, excess treatment that they don't need. So it's a, it's a, a difficult balance to, to strike there and it's important to, uh, to understand melanocytic lesions really well. And I still obtain a consultation from my Dermpath colleagues on a daily basis, pretty much, almost daily basis, uh, with difficult melanocytic lesions, even though I've been in practice for some time now. And um, so I encourage you to remember that this video is for education only. Um, please don't sue me. That's what I'm trying to say. If you have a difficult lesion in all, all seriousness, please um, get consultation, get help with it if you're struggling with a melanocytic lesion. Uh, don't use this video as a replacement for expert consultation, okay? The next thing, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, is that some areas of, uh, I mean, all, all parts of pathology have different controversies and different schools of thought, but I think that that's particularly true in, in the melanocytic area of dermatopathology. There are lots of different um, opinions, and some of them are very strongly held or very dogmatically held by different people about um, uh, different types of melanocytic lesions, dysplastic nevus, spitz nevi, and atypical spitzoid things. Those are some good examples where you have very strong schools of thought about, um, about how we should handle those lesions. And I'll address those in later videos and teach you the way that I currently do it. And, um, and then you can take that and you can do some additional reading and learn uh, which way you want to handle these things. All right, so I think that those are the main disclaimers. And now what we're gonna talk about first is a few things before talking about all the different types of melanocytic lesions, we need to understand some basic principles. So this video is gonna focus on the basic uh, features of benign nevi. And this is good because you can kind of use this list to keep an idea of, oh, here's a melanocytic lesion. Does it have all of these features? Well, then that's, those are all helpful pointers to deciding if it's benign or not. And I'll do another video about the basic patterns that we see in um, uh, melanomas. And then I will do different videos after that about individual subtypes of nevi or melanoma to highlight their specific features. Okay, that's the plan. So let's start with nevi. So let's go to low power here. I'm sorry you've been looking at that picture all this time while I'm giving the disclaimers, but I think that those are important disclaimers to start this series with. And hopefully now I, I won't have to do them every video. So here's a shave biopsy. Most of the melanocytic lesions I see in practice are, are shave biopsied by dermatologists. A lot of, um, are there, some people do not like the idea of shaving, um, doing a shave biopsy of melanocytic lesions. I actually personally um, prefer to look at a shave biopsy provided it's an adequate size shave. Uh, like you can see here, this is a nice shave biopsy even though the lesion is positive at the margins. 
the dermatologist probably did this biopsy with the intent of removing most of the lesions. So there may be a little lesion left in the patient at both edges and a little bit down deep, but they got a nice scoop shave underneath the lesion that gives me a view of the vast majority of the lesion most likely. Based on the dermatologist that I know and the way they practice, they usually shave pigmented lesions with the intent to, to remove most or all of the lesion. If your clinicians tend to give you partial biopsies of large pigmented lesions, it's important to have conversations with them and let them know that they need to tell you if they are doing that. I personally do not like a partial biopsy of a, a pigmented lesion, although sometimes really large pigmented lesions, particularly on the face or on acral skin, sometimes I understand why that's necessary because uh, it's hard to remove the whole thing and you want to know if you're dealing with a benign or a malignant lesion before doing a surgical procedure. So that's fine, but it's just a really important that the clinicians let you know that on the requisition form when they send the sample to your laboratory. So um, that's a conversation that you can have uh, over and over again to remind um, your treating physician colleagues, whether they be dermatologists or primary care docs or surgeons, to remind them to please let you know if they're ever doing a partial biopsy of a big melanocytic lesion because that's potentially dangerous to you and to the patient and to them, to everyone involved, if you think that you're looking at the whole lesion and there's really a lot of it left in the patient. All right, so on a shave biopsy, we're looking at here, even though we can't see the whole lesion, we can see most of it, there are a handful of features that benign nevi have, okay? First, and these, these are just general guidelines, they're not hard and fast rules, pretty much all of the things I'm gonna teach you in all of these videos can be broken. There are exceptions to almost all the rules, which I know is frustrating. It's frustrating to me too in practice. I wish it were more simple and that there were hard and fast rules that were never broken, but unfortunately, the human body doesn't read textbooks and doesn't care what we as pathologists think that um, the rules should be. So we have to learn to play by, by the body's rules, not by our rules, okay? So a few things that I like to look for in benign nevi. Number one is symmetry. What I mean by symmetry is that the, the right-hand side and the left-hand side, it doesn't matter which side's which, but one side of the lesion and the other side of the lesion look relatively similar to each other from low power. And if you draw a line down the middle, this side of the lesion and that, just from the silhouette, the, the low power architectural pattern, they look relatively similar. Yeah, there may be some kind of cystic invagination to the epidermis over here that look a little different, but the melanocytes, you can see they're kind of big nests along the top, smaller cells sprinkled along the bottom, kind of in a band. There, it's an evenly distributed lesion on the right side and the left side. It's kind of a mirror image, one side of the other. Okay, and you may be frustrated looking at this very low power picture and say, but I can't see if there's atypia or not. Don't look for atypia first, okay? Look at the low power. This is pretty much true of most of Dermpath, but especially melanocytic lesions. I think you've gotta start at low power and try to decide from low magnification, do you think that the overall features look more like a nevus or a melanoma? And then, or maybe the other answer is I'm not sure from this power. Then once you make that decision at low power, you can go to higher power and take a look and see if the, the cytologic features and some of the other high power details, if those confirm your low power suspicions. I think that's important because if you go to high power, you can find an atypical cell in the majority of nevi. You can find a big or funny looking cell and say, oh, it's atypical, it's melanoma. Don't do that, okay? You're gonna, it's gonna make life harder for you. And if you're a resident watching this, it is hard looking at these things at low power at first. So if you find this challenging, so did I when I started as a resident. I looked at melanocytic lesions and I thought I wanted to be a derm path. And then after looking at some melanocytic things, I thought I can never learn to do this. Well, I think I've learned how to do this at least decently. And, um, and it was after spending some time with really wonderful dermatopathologists um, who were my mentors that I really learned how to interpret these lesions. So with practice, you can learn to do this. So don't be afraid, it's okay. It just takes practice and, and pushing yourself and stretching your limits by looking at low power as you practice and learn these lesions, I think that really helps you to become better. And it also makes you faster as a dermatopathologist. It helps you to get through cases and to, to know how to process them and work through them algorithmically. All right, so symmetry is, is one feature that we see side to side. Uh, the lesion looks relatively the same. The other thing that we look for is maturation, okay? So maturation only works for melanocytic lesions that have a dermal component. Let's talk about that for a minute first. In melanocytic nevi, we use three different terms to explain where the melanocytes are located. If the melanocytes are all in the epidermis, we will call that a junctional nevus. If they are all in the dermis, we call it an intradermal nevus. And if they're both in the epidermis and the dermis, we call it a compound nevus. So here, Let's look at what we have. 
we have a lot of melanocytes in the dermis, but we also have some nests of melanocytes that are in the epidermis as well. So we have these nests. Nests are aggregates of melanocytes all grouped together, and they're kind of hanging off of some of these elongated reedy ridges from the epidermis. Let's see if I can get that into better focus here. All right, so those, that's what we call the junctional component of the lesion, the nests of melanocytes that are in the epidermis. And you can see they kind of look like they're in the dermis, but they're actually attached to, there's a reedy ridge, here's a reedy ridge. And if you need a refresher on what reedy ridges are and what normal melanocytes look like, which is really important actually, I forgot to mention that, to understand nevi, you need to start with a basic understanding of how to tell keratinocytes and melanocytes apart on H&E stain only. And I have a video on normal skin histology that addresses that. If you look in the upper right hand corner of this video, I'll put in a link and you can click that and watch that video if you need a refresher on skin histology. So the nests in the epidermis are called the junctional component of the nevus. The uh, rest of the, the melanocytic lesion down in the dermis is the intradermal component. And again, when you have both of these components present in a nevus, we call it a compound nevus. All right. Now listen, some people get really hung up over, is there one nest in the epidermis or not? What if I call it intradermal nevus, but there's actually a nest in the epidermis and it's really a compound nevus instead? That's okay, no one is going to die or be harmed if you call something an intradermal nevus and there's a nest or two in the epidermis. It doesn't matter. The, the reason that we talk about these things is more, is more for us as pathologists to understand how to conceptualize the way that nevi grow, the way that they look architecturally, microscopically. So whether, whether or not there's a nest in the dermis or a nest in the epidermis, that is not something that I try to spend a lot of time worrying about. I look at the lesion. If it looks like it's pretty much all in the dermis, I call it intradermal. And I don't spend time hunting around for one junctional nest because that's not a good use of my time or of my worry. I want to spend my time and my worry on lesions where I'm really worried, is this a melanoma or not? It's very atypical. I'm not sure. Those are the times that you need to spend a lot of time really carefully thinking about a lesion. Obviously, benign nevi, deciding to call it compound or junctional or intradermal, to me, that's not a good use of your time to worry about that distinction. That's not that important, okay? It's just we talk about these things because, again, it helps us to understand them. All right, so I guess I, I started with maturation, but I should mention that, first of all, in the junctional component, the way that nevi grow is usually they are arranged in nests, and those nests are located down at the basal layer or at the tips of reedy ridges, okay? You can see right here, here's nests, and there, here's a hair follicle they're actually kind of attached to, but they're growing, it's the same concept. They're growing and they're attached to a little reedy ridge right there. This is a nest and it's attached to a reedy ridge, okay? Now look, you might see a couple of these melanocytes are big. Oh, you, that's a cytologic atypia. Let, we'll talk a little more about atypical, atypia later, but again, this nevus has an obvious benign appearance from low power, and this is okay that there's some larger uh, melanocytes. Actually, uh, this nevus was from the uh, genital area, and nevi in the genital area can have some slightly unusual features. So the junctional component should be arranged in nests, or sometimes you'll have single cells, but when you do have single cells, they'll look like this. Here's a single cell. That's a melanocyte right there. Here's one right here. And look where they're located. They're located down at the basal layer. They're not high up. So what we don't want to see is high level um, uh, melanocytes or melanocytes that are making a solid line replacing the basal layer. High level um, uh, melanocytes that are moving up, we call that pagetoid spread. That's one feature uh, often seen in melanomas and not as often seen in nevi. Again, there are exceptions to this rule. And also, if we have a lot of single melanocytes that are replacing the whole basal layer up and down, even between the reedy ridges, that's a feature we call confluence. That's a feature of melanomas, not of nevi. Again, exceptions exist to that rule. And I'm going to have a second video about melanomas and we'll cover those things in greater detail. But for nevi, you should either have the single cell should either be down the reedy or should be spaced out from one another by intervening normal keratinocytes. You should not have a replacement of the basal layer by a solid line of melanocytes and you should not have high level spread of melanocytes. Now, what about that? That's a pale little cell there. 
That is actually a keratinocyte. Look, it's a nucleus with a vacuole around it, a naked nucleus, usually is a keratinocyte with an artifactual vacuole, and a nucleus that has gray cytoplasm stuck to it and has a little vacuole artifact around the outside, that's gonna be a melanocyte. And again, go watch that skin histology video I made, and I explain that in greater detail there. Uh, I think it's such a useful way to tell apart melanocytes and keratinocytes. So the junctional component should either be well nested or when it has single cells, the single cells should be spaced out from each other and mostly down the tips of reedy ridges. You should not have much pagetoid spread or confluent growth ideally, okay? Then let's look at the dermal component. When you have a dermal component, you can look for something that we call maturation. Now maturation is something that we we see only in nevi that are intradermal or compound. You can't talk about maturation in a junctional nevus because maturation is talking about the pattern of growth in the dermis. So junctional nevi don't have a dermal component. You can't assess maturation for, um, for a, a junctional nevi, just like you cannot assess confluent, if there's confluent growth or pagetoid spread in an intradermal nevus, you can't look for that because it does, there's nothing in the epidermis in an intradermal nevus, okay? So here, what, what um, maturation is talking about, the other word sometimes people like to use is zonation. And there's a lot of history behind this that goes way back in the literature, way before I was born, but the idea that at one time people thought that melanocytes started in the epidermis and they grew down deeper in the dermis and changed the way they looked as they got deeper and that they were the melanocytes were maturing with age and, and getting more mature. And I think that, that biologically now, my understanding is that that, that view is not really believed anymore. There may be melanocytic biologists out there that have a much more nuanced understanding of this than I do. But the, the other term that people sometimes use is zonation because there's zones at the superficial part of the lesion and as you go deeper down there are kind of zones. And you can kind of see that here. There's a zone up here. This whole area up at the top is composed of larger melanocytes that have large round or oval nuclei, a lot of cytoplasm, and they're arranged into kind of large nests. As we go deeper down in the lesion, the melanocytes get smaller, the nests get smaller, and eventually the melanocytes actually start turning into little single cells that trickle out into the dermis in between collagen bundles. See that? So up here we have the nests of larger epithelioid melanocytes, and as we go down they get smaller, and they lose that large nest and they actually get into more like single cell growth that grows in between the collagen. So that is a normal maturation pattern or normal zonation. I still like to use the word maturation even if that's not really what's happening biologically. I, I, it's the word I, I learned and it's just comfortable for me. So again, all the terms that we use to explain things, we have to remember you have to use the terms that work best for your memory and that help you, whatever helps you to remember the features you need to make the right diagnosis for the patient, I personally don't care what you call it. And I tell my residents all the time, you don't have to like the analogy I use. Find the analogy that works for you and then use that. Whatever it takes to make the right diagnosis for patient care, that's what matters. Patient care is what matters, at least for me as a practicing pathologist. All right, so let's look closer at the features. So these melanocytes up here in the superficial aspect, both in the, in the junction of the lesion and in the superficial dermis. So you can see both ones that are connected to the epidermis and also that are situated in the superficial dermis here. They are a kind of large melanocytes with a lot of cytoplasm. So we say that they're epithelioid. Epithelioid means they look like epithelial cells. They are round to oval nuclei. They are um, and have abundant cytoplasm, all right? So some people call these type A melanocytes. So you can use types A, B, and C to, re to um, describe the different morphologies of melanocytes that are seen in nevi. And these terms, again, are not, it doesn't matter the terminology, but I think it is useful conceptually to help you remember how melanocytic nevi are supposed to look. So type A melanocytes are usually larger, epithelioid, they're arranged in big nests, and they're located in the junction or the superficial dermis. As you go deeper, you may have thought from low power especially that you can see these melanocytes are much smaller than the melanocytes up top and they almost look at low power like lymphocytes because they're a lot darker, they're small, round, dark blue nuclei, okay, and they don't have as much cytoplasm. So at low power, let's go back to real low power, you might think at first that these are inflammatory cells, that they're a, a band of lymphocytes underneath a melanocytic nevi. And melanocytic nevi do get inflamed sometimes, and sometimes it can be hard, and even for me at first glance, sometimes I'll think something's inflammation, and I look closer and they're actually melanocytes. But go and look closer at the cytologic features of these.
These are actually These are actually much bigger than uh, actual lymphocytes. So when you get in close, you can see, let me turn the light up a little bit here, that these nuclei are, are much larger than lymphocytes for one thing. Let's look over here and see if we can find a lymphocyte for comparison. Okay, maybe we'll go back to 40X. 60X doesn't always work well on video. Here. This right here is probably a lymphocyte. It, the nucleus is very small. It's, the chromatin is so dark that it almost looks black. It's such a dark purple because the chromatin is so compact that it looks very, very dark. And uh, there's almost no cytoplasm that's visible on, um, on an H&E stain. And then over here though, looking at these melanocytes, you can see that actually most of them have a much more open chromatin. They have like a kind of a, a medium color purple. And I know it's hard to see in the video, but you, if you look on your own microscope, you can actually see the chromatin's real fine. You can see the pattern of the chromatin. You can see light through the, the, chroma, the nucleus. The, you can see some light shining through. So it has kind of a, a, um, an even fine chromatin that some light passes through. Whereas again, the, the lymphocyte nucleus looks almost black. And then there is a little bit of cytoplasm, even though it's not much, there is a little cytoplasm that's uh, separating these melanocytes from one another. These small round blue melanocytes that look kind of like lymphocytes are called type B, B as in boy, type B melanocytes, okay? So type A melanocytes are most superficial. As you go deeper, you get type B melanocytes. And those type B melanocytes can either be arranged in small kind of sheet-like areas like this. See, they're not well-formed nests. They're kind of making a band where they're all crushed together. And then as you go even deeper down, they usually have this tendency to kind of trickle out in single rows or cords in between the collagen bundles in the reticular dermis. And if you think about epithelial lesions, when we see single cells trickling out into the dermis or into the surrounding uh, stroma, that's usually a worrisome sign, right? We think of that as infiltration or invasion growth, but that's not at all the way that melanocytic lesions, they kind of break a lot of the rules that we use for defining benign and malignant for uh, epithelial tumors. Melanocytic neoplasms are usually, benign melanocytic neoplasms usually will have this kind of, quote, infiltrative looking pattern, and that's totally normal to have these tri trickling single cells, but note how there's no inflammatory response or fibrosis or desmoplasia. The dermis is totally happy and fine having all of these little melanocytes living in it, and that's that's because these melanocytes probably, this is probably a congenital nevus that's been there since the patient was born. I don't know that for sure, but a lot of times when you have these trickling melanocytes at the bottom, that's one sign of a congenital nevus. We'll talk about congenital nevi a little later. So this is a normal, benign, reassuring feature. Melanos, uh, melanomas can do this, but, but a lot of times they won't. A lot of times melanomas are gonna look kind of all the same from top to bottom. They're gonna have abnormal maturation where they have large cells at the top and the bottom. They don't get smaller as you go deeper into the dermis. They tend to have large nests or large pushing borders and not these nice trickling smaller cells at the bottom, okay? So this is normal maturation. Going back to low power again, it's best to see maturation from low power. You have nests of epithelial melanocytes up top, the type A melanocytes. As you go deeper, they start getting smaller and we call those type B melanocytes. You go deeper still, they, those small type B melanocytes start to trickle out in between the reticular dermal collagen bundles. All of those are benign features. And there's one other type of melanocyte, I'm gonna to switch to a different case real quick. And it's called a type C melanocyte. And these are melanocytes that are spindled. Let's see, I think this is a case that has it. And look how spindly they are. They're spindled means they're long and thin and stretched out rather than round nuclei. And in fact, they are so spindly that they look a lot like Schwann cells. If you are familiar with um, other aspects of pathology, you may recognize this pattern and think that it looks a lot like a neurofibroma. And if you think that, you're right, it does. It looks very what we call neurotized. It looks neural. And remember that melanocytes and Schwann cells both come from the neural crest, the neuroectoderm. And so embryologically, they are from the same origin. So they have a lot of similarities, both in the way they stain, in the way they grow, and some other features, which we'll talk about later. All right, so these spindled melanocytes can look I almost identical to um, a neurofibroma, in fact, in some cases. And if you look around here, you'll even see things like this, which these are, these are what we call 
um, Wagner Meissner bodies if they were in a neurofibroma. They're these kind of swirls of spindle cells that recapitulate the Meissner corpuscles that we see as fine touch receptors in acral skin. And you can see those in diffuse type neurofibromas and you can also see, and look there's many of them, all of these little round swirly structures in here are basically uh, Wagner-Meissner bodies or Wagner-Meissner-esque bodies. I'm not sure if you're actually supposed to call them that, but they look just like Wagner-Meissner bodies, okay? And you can see them in neurotized nevi. So anyway, that's the third type of um, melanocyte that we'll see. The third pattern is these spindled, thin, spindled, bland melanocytes that we call um, uh, type C melanocytes, and we see those uh, really prominently in some nevi. We call them neurotized nevi. I don't usually put that in my report, but I think it's a useful concept, all right? Back to our original lesion. So you'll notice though that we don't have any type C melanocytes here. That's okay. Not every nevus has every one of those three types. A, B, and C can be present in different amounts and not every lesion has each one. Most nevi I feel have type A melanocytes most of the time. There's exceptions to that of course, but a lot of them do. Type B and type C, it's kind of hit or miss. Sometimes you have A and B only. Sometimes you'll have A, B, and C. Sometimes you'll have a lot of B or very little. Sometimes you'll have a lot of C where the whole lesion can be composed of of type C melanocytes. These are, again, just useful clues for the pattern. The, but the main thing is, is that as you go from top to bottom, you should go from A to B to C. If all three are present, usually it's gonna be in that order. The deepest aspected lesion usually is gonna have type C. The, more, the, the smaller and more spindly and more single melanocytes, the deeper you go. So that's normal maturation, okay? Now, let's talk about cytologic features, which is something that people, especially pathologists, we are trained to look at cytologic features as part of our training, and so it is important to look at them. So, uh, so what we're, we like to talk about is, is cytologic atypia. I think that you have to use, I think it's the best way to approach melanocytic lesions though, like I said earlier, is looking at the architecture first, and then after all of that, you can go down and look at the cytology and look for mitotic activity in the dermis to see if there's anything there that should worry you that maybe the lesion could be a melanoma. Because there are some melanomas that at low power look very much like nevi, but at high power they have a lot of uh, severe nuclear atypia and a lot of dermal mitotic activity. We call those nevoid melanomas meaning that they are mimicking a nevus from low power, but they're still malignant. And that is the reason that I personally like to look at higher power on um, most melanocytic lesions. I think that's a good idea. Even though usually you can make a diagnosis from very low power, I usually like to go to higher power to check and make sure I'm not missing something um, that I didn't notice from low power, all right? So one main point that I'd like to make is that atypia, cytologic atypia, is in the eye of the beholder. And one of my mentors, Bruce Smoller, who's a really great dermatopathologist, he loved to say that, and I think it's such a great quote, that you know what might be not atypical to me might look atypical to you. And what threshold we use for establishing atypia is really um, kind of fluid and subjective, and you know it can, it can even change throughout the course of a day or between people or over time, and there have been studies that have shown that. And so that's why atypia can be kind of a challenging feature, all right? Let's look. This is, like I said, this is a nevus from the genitals. And so sometimes the melanocytes can be larger and look kind of funny in these. But I think that these melanocytes here actually look very nice and bland and, and what, we would, what I would say nevoid. They look like nevus cells. They are oval to round nuclei. They have very fine, delicate chromatin. Sorry, I'm trying to get it in focus here for the screen. And they have tiny little nucleoli, little punctate nucleoli in the middle. Their nuclear membranes are nice and smooth overall. Sometimes they can get kind of angulated shapes. That's, that's normal, especially in some nevi. See, these are a little bit more oval or elongated. And some of them get a little squished, and that's okay. Sometimes they can have a little darker chromatin, and that can vary a lot depending on one lab's H&E stain versus another. So if you're looking at a case from another lab, it, and I, if I'm struggling with a melanocytic lesion on a case that's sent to me in consult, for example, a lot of times, yeah, you can do special stains or immunostains, sometimes those help, but a lot of times the most important thing to do is, is take the block and get a new H&E stain in my own lab because it's the H&E quality and color that I'm most used to looking at as a dermatopathologist. 
okay? So that's the way I do it. Like my, one of my mentors who trained me in fellowship, Doug Parker, who is my program director, he said, you've got to play on your home turf. He likes sports a lot and he, he likes to say, you got to play, play ball on your home turf. And so you have to kind of get the stain that you're used to and interpret it in the context that you you're used to looking at difficult cases in. All right, so I think that these are what normal Nevis cells look like. I already showed you the type B melanocytes. And having some scattered, like look, here's a larger cell. Having some scattered larger cells is totally acceptable in, in Nevi. Okay, again, there's different settings and scenarios where I interpret that differently. In a congenital nevus on a young person, I see pretty large melanocytes on a regular basis and that doesn't bother me at all. I don't think that's cytologic atypia. Now that said, if I start seeing a lot of large melanocytes in the junctional component of a of a lesion on, on the face of an 80 year old sun damaged white patient, that's gonna worry me a lot more, okay? Because that's the kind of context where mel melanomas tend to happen. And again, we'll cover all these things in more nuanced detail in other videos. Now you might notice up here, what's this? Oh, it's a mitosis, uh-oh. It looks like a spider crawling on there. So, well, what are we gonna do with that? Well, I would, I would, Again, this is why it's so important to be able to tell melanocytes apart from keratinocytes. These are keratinocytes, and you can see there's a little swirl of keratin here. This is part of a hair follicle, or probably a hair follicle, and this is a little bit, or maybe even the edge of an eccrine duct. These are, these are keratinocytes, and this is probably a dividing keratinocyte. And now, how do I know for sure? Well, I don't. And that's one reason that usually when we're looking for mitotic activity, we look in the intradermal component, especially when, we're, when we know it's a melanoma and we're counting mitoses for the sake of putting them into the prognostic parameters, we only count dermal mitoses, not junctional or intraepidermal ones, because in the epidermis, it's harder to tell if a mitosis truly belongs to a melanocyte or a keratinocyte. Sometimes I think like right here, very obvious that this is in a keratinocyte. There are no melanocytes right here. This is all keratinocyte, okay? But I think there have been some studies that show that that junctional, um, if you have an obvious um, my uh, mitosis in a junctional melanocyte nest that sometimes melanomas do have a higher uh, chance of having mitoses in the junctional component. So don't ignore them if you see them, but do remember that in when they're in uh, the epidermis, mitoses can be harder to be sure if it's actually in a melanocyte or not. Now I did see one actually over here. Oh, look at that. Here we've got a nest of melanocytes coming off the junction and we've got an obvious mitosis and it's obviously in a melanocyte. Now we have a mitosis, so have I been telling you wrong this whole video? Is this actually a melanoma? Well, I hope not. Um, and uh, the reason is that you can actually have mitoses in a significant portion of nevi, okay? Benign nevi can have mitoses. Now, be careful and listen to me here. If I see a mitosis, I do look around a little bit more to see if there are other mitoses to make sure I'm not missing something worse. And I also back up and look and make sure that, the, that architecturally and all the other features, everything looks like a nevus. So don't ignore mitoses when you see them, but you can go and search literature. There are good papers out there that show that if you look really carefully, benign nevi will often have one mitosis in them. And occasionally they can have more, particularly like in pregnant women, you can have increased mitoses. If I start finding multiple mitoses, then that's the time to really be careful, consider doing additional workup, consider getting an expert consultation. So again, I'm not telling you to just be flippant and disregard these, but don't let one mitosis in an otherwise perfectly benign nevus uh, make you say, oh, this has to be melanoma. That would be a bad decision to do, okay? And again, look at the, the uh, cytologic features here. These are nice, normal uh, melanocytes. And sometimes melanocytes can have little punctate um, nucleoli in benign nevi, particularly in acral nevi, I see that, and in some other places too. And uh, other times the melanocytes will, will have, uh, it won't have those nucleoli, all right? Really large nucleoli, really big atypical hyperchromatic cells, really, really um, prominent pleomorphism, um, really hyperchromatic, irregular nuclei. Those things can be worrisome signs, but again, I think that cytologic atypia is one of the harder things to evaluate and it's very subjective. So I think that learning the architectural features is a much more important clue. And then the cytologic features come after that, in my opinion. And again, you can look around and I usually do like to glance around and make sure that I'm not missing any significant mitotic activity or atypia. And a lot of that comes with practice, but I do think that that's important to make sure I'm not missing a nevoid melanoma, okay? So again, the features we had were symmetry, maturation, melanocytes that are at the basal layer rather than pagetoid, melanocytes that are spaced out in the epidermis from one another rather than confluent, 
bland cytology, meaning a lack of significant cytologic atypia, and low or no mitotic activity in the dermis. All right, so those are the general features, the general rules that I like to look for. And again, they're not hard and fast rules. There are exceptions to all of them. So now I'm gonna go through a handful of different nevi and point out some other features. So some of these are different types of nevus. For example, I think that a lot of people would classify this as a dysplastic nevus or a Clark's nevus as some people like to call them. Some people would not. Some people don't believe those terms exist. Again, that's a controversy that we'll deal with in another video. But what I do want to point out here, if I can get it in focus, is where are, this is right here, what we're looking at mostly is junctional nevus. There may be a couple dermal nests. I think there's like one dermal nest maybe right here. But look where the melanocytes are. This may look busy to you at first. Busy meaning like there's a lot of cells in it. But look where they are. They're all down in the tips of elongated reedy. And in fact, there's kind of bridging between the tips, which is one of the features of dysplastic nevi. But there's a great tip that my friend uh, Ben Wood, who's a dermatopathologist in Australia, and he's really good at teaching uh, visual tricks for recognizing um, different types of melanocytic lesions. He likes to say, if you go here, these are the dermal papillae, right, in between the reedy ridges. He said, if you draw a line along the top of the dermal papillae, and most of the melanocytes are down below that in the reedy ridges, that's a good sign that would favor a nevus over a melanoma usually. And I think that's a really great pearl and it's such a simple way to explain that you can have increased numbers of melanocytes and, um, and even single cells as long as they're down in the tips of the reedy. See, there's lots of single cells all mixed in here, but that's okay, they're down in the reedy. What they're not doing is growing up between the reedy. If you have lots of single cells in the inter-reedy space, lots of single melanocytes there, or again, pagetoid spread, those things are things that worry us for the possibility of a melanoma. Now, you may say, well, look at all the pigment here. So I think that's a good, a good point that we should talk about too. Pigment, melanin pigment, okay? Melanocytes make melanin pigment, but if you think back to the normal biology of normal melanocytes, melanocytes make the pigment and then they send it out through their cytoplasm through dendritic processes that then get taken up by neighboring keratinocytes. And the keratinocytes are the cells that actually store the melanin pigment to make kind of a barrier against the ultraviolet radiation from the sun, okay? So melanocytes usually, despite the fact that you they make the melanin, they usually do not look dark brown. There are exceptions but they usually have a pink or gray cytoplasm and it's the keratinocytes that will usually have the dark colored uh, pigment in their cytoplasm and again go back to that skin histology video if you haven't watched it yet I talk about that in a lot of detail but here are the keratinocytes and they have like little umbrellas little hats made out of melanin so these cells in the epidermis that have a lot of pigment usually are going to actually be keratinocytes not melanocytes here these are the melanocytes and look they have this gray um, this grayish pink um, cytoplasm and they might have some little specks of melanin pigment but they usually don't have tons of melanin there are exceptions to this of course like everything else I'm teaching you but I think that that's really useful the paler the cytoplasm that's the ones that are gonna usually be melanocytes the dark pigmented brown cytoplasm those are usually the keratinocytes and in the dermis when you see dark pigment those are not usually melanocytes those are usually melanophages Pigmented um, melanocytic lesions sometimes make almost no pigment. Sometimes they make lots of pigment. It just, it, I don't always understand why. It just depends on the particular lesion. And also dark skin patients I've noticed tend to make a lot more pigment in their nevi and their melanocytes tend to have a lot more pigment in them when they make nevi. So, so that's another exception to the rule that in a, in a darkly pigmented patient, um, you know, black or brown skinned patient, uh, nevi tend to have a lot more pigment overall. But melanocytic lesions and other pigmented lesions when, when there's damage to some of the cells that contain the pigment, whether they're uh, keratinocytes or melanocytes, the pigment will fall down into the dermis. We call this pigment incontinence or pigment dropout. And then the melanin pigment gets eaten up by these, these uh, macrophages. And so they get packed full, kind of constipated basically with melanin pigment. And we call those melanophages, okay? So when you see the dark cells down in the dermis, these are usually gonna be macrophages that are laden with melanin pigment, not melanocytes, okay? So most of the time. So in the epidermis, the dark brown pigmented cells are keratinocytes, and in the dermis, they are usually melanophages, macrophages. And again, look at the melanocytes. Usually have a pink to gray cytoplasm, and sometimes they have little brown specks of melanin in their cytoplasm, but usually the really dark cells here, 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 all of these, those are all keratinocytes, okay? Now, the other thing I'll point out here just because it's cool and I like it 
is that this particular type of um, nevus has a lot of these really, really dark, round dots of melanin. And these are called macro melanosomes. And they're really pretty and cool, and I love when I see them. And they're usually seen in benign nevi, particularly in nevi that have a lot of pigment in the keratinocytes. So I just love these macro melanosomes. I think they're like so perfectly round and uh, I don't know, very visually pleasing to the eye. Look at how many of them there are, they're so pretty. So you can see them actually the, one of the most common times, I'll usually see them I guess in melanocytic uh, lesions that have a lot of pigment in the keratinocytes. So I like to call melanocytic lesions like that lentiginous nevi. Nevi that have long reedy ridges and a lot of pigment. And I think that those actually are kind of challenging. Again, Dr. Parker said that when you see m m uh, lentiginous looking melanocytic lesions, they, they at first look a lot more scary than they are because from low power, they look really darkly pigmented and it's a little harder because a lot of times the, the uh, melanocytes are kind of single or in small nests and it's hard to tell the melanocytes from the keratinocytes down in the tips of the reedy. So it takes a little practice to learn how to interpret these. Um, but I think when you see a lot of pigment in a, in a melanocytic uh, lesion, back up and slow down and don't get really worked up and think, oh, it's got to be malignant, okay? Don't over, don't, the, the presence of pigment by itself is not a feature that can tell melanoma from nevus. And in fact, I probably see a lot more benign nevi that have lots of melanin pigment than melanomas that do. That's not a hard and fast rule, but I definitely see plenty of nevi on a regular basis that have lots of uh, pigment. So, in, and I told you earlier that, that some people will classify this as a dysplastic nevus because of the bridging and there's some a little bit of this kind of fibroplasia wrapping of collagen around the tips of the reedy. But I find that a lot of the lesions that when I started practice I called mild dysplastic nevus. And again, you may not believe in dysplastic nevus or grade them. I, it's okay. Don't, you know, you can leave comments below and argue with me. I understand that the controversy exists. But the point is, is that things that I, when I started practice that I called dysplastic nevi, I find that over time I've started to call more and more of those things lentiginous nevi. I think that my threshold has kind of changed over time. Um, and, uh, and I think that lentiginous nevi look clinically uh, darker and they look flat and kind of with irregular borders and look a lot like dysplastic nevi do. And so I think that they get biopsied frequently. In any case, whatever name you want to call these things, just recognize that the pigmented lesions like this that have a lot of pigment in the keratinocytes, not necessarily malignant, and they can be a little harder to interpret without practice to learn to tell the keratinocytes and the melanocytes apart. And again, look, all of these gray cells down here, the busy kind of jumbliness that you're seeing, those are all the melanocytes down in the tips of the reedy. Up here, almost nothing. There may be a rare melanocyte here and there, but really, they're all down the tips of the reedy, and that's a reassuring, usually a benign feature it, that's more commonly seen in nevi than in melanoma, okay? Here's another lesion that I think, again, uh, would probably be classified by most people, or by, by some people at least, as dysplastic. And even from low power, you can see this is a compound nevus. We've got a junctional component, and we've got a dermal component. And again, the point of this video is not about dysplastic nevus or not, or different types of nevi. The point is nevus, recognizing all the features that help us decide something's a nevus, not a melanoma, okay? And look, like I told you, the junctional component tends to be nested in nevi and tends to be down the tips of reedy. And I, that's why I'm showing this case because it beautifully shows all the nests are down at the tips of reedy. There's no single cell growth in between the reedy. There's no pagetoid spread. These are the features of a benign nevus. Whether you call it dysplastic or not, or what name you like, that, that's a different, different conversation and is nowhere near as important as deciding if something's a nevus or a melanoma. And again, look at the dermal component. It's not quite as thick and deep as that first lesion I showed you when we talked about maturation, but look what happens. You go from, sorry, it's a little faded, it's a, the slides are getting a bit old. You go from nests up here of larger epithelioid melanocytes, type A melanocytes, and note that they have a grayish cytoplasm. Even though they do have a little stippling of brown melanin, they have a grayish color overall. And again, you can see the real dark cells next to them. Those are the keratinocytes. These are the, these, sorry, my arrow is not very good. These are the melanocytes in here. So these are type A melanocytes. And then as you go down into the dermis, what happens? They get smaller. They don't make as large nests. They kind of get dispersed out a little bit. They start kind of trickling down as single cells down into the reticular dermis, see? 
So this is normal maturation. So we have a normal junctional pattern that's nested predominantly. Many nevi are pre have a predominance of nests, although there are some, those lentiginous nevi, like I showed you, that can have single cells in the junction. But whether it's nests or single cells, again, the important thing is looking to see if there's, uh, there should be minimal pagetoid spread most of the time and no confluent growth most of the time. And the dermis shows nice maturation. And cytologically, some of these cells are larger up here, but we don't see severe, really ugly atypia. And to me, that's the most important thing is looking for whether cells are smaller or larger is not as important as looking, do I see things that are unequivocally, cytologically very worrisome for malignancy? That's what I'm looking for when I look closer. Not, is this cell a little bigger or a little smaller? I think that that's a lot less important than looking for really distinctly a atypical abnormal nuclei, really massive, really hyperchromatic, pleomorphic, ang you know, irregular nuclear membranes, really large nuclei. Those things are what I look for as the most important features for looking for cytologic atypia. And even then though, even severe cytologic atypia doesn't always mean that it's melanoma, but it means that you really need to be sure that you've really considered that possibility and made sure that it's not before you call it anything else. And again, we have normal maturation and there's, uh, if there are mitoses here, they are not standing out after looking at multiple fields. So mitotic activity is low or absent. Compound nevus, again, I think people would probably call this dysplastic many times, but in any case, it's a nevus, not a melanoma, and that's the important thing. Now, let's look at this lesion. Now, this is a lot bigger than the other lesions that I've showed you so far. It's, even from here, we're on 2x magnification, and this lesion starts up, up at the top and it goes way, way deep into the dermis. And look, it's still present down at the bottom. It's still positive down at the deep edge of the shave. So it's a really thick lesion. Now, that does not mean something's melanoma just because it's big or thick. Because again, this is not an epi epithelial lesion where you're worried that this is invasive growth. Nevi can go way deep into the dermis and even into the subcutis and still be totally benign, okay? And in fact, the bigger, deeper lesions like this, most of the ones that I see end up being nevi, okay? And that's why I'd like to show you these because this is a nevus with what we call congenital features. Congenital nevi tend to have a certain set of features and when we see those in, in nevi in really young patients, you can just say it's a congenital nevus. In older adults, I don't always know if they've truly had it since they were born or not. So I say it's a compound nevus, comma, congenital type or congenital pattern. And some people think that it, that it doesn't matter to say that. It doesn't really matter clinically. Again, this is these are points for the pathologist to know that there are some unusual features in congenital pattern nevi, and I think that they're helpful because they're really strong features that point towards benign rather than malignant. And some of them look kind of funny if you're not used to them and might make you think of malignancy until you recognize that they're okay and totally normal. So let's talk about those. First, I want to talk about one thing that before I forget. Look at this. If you've done some derm path, you may recognize a seborrheic keratosis. The epidermis gets kind of thick or sends kind of long strands down, and then you get these horn pseudocysts of keratin that are trapped inside. Nevi often induce this kind of change in the epidermis over top of them. So don't say that this is a seborrheic keratosis plus a nevus. Now, sometimes I do see that. I'll see a, a seb with a nevus right next to it or something. But in general, if I see a surface that looks like a seborrheic keratosis, but right in the midst of it, there are nevus cells, I just call it a nevus. And that, that surface change is kind of an unusual phenomenon where the, 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 um, the melanocytes induce the epidermis to grow and proliferate in a kind of funny pattern that mimics seborrheic keratosis, okay? And it's a feature that I see way more often in benign nevi than in melanomas. I'm not sure that by itself it discriminates, but I definitely see, uh, see it usually in nevi, okay? And often in big, thick, congenital nevi like this. All right, <clears throat> but let's look at a few of the features. First, let me get it in focus here. Firstly, most of this lesion's in the dermis. And all of these purple, islands right here, these are all keratinocytes, okay? These are islands of keratinocyte. They're not, they're, what they are is they're elongated reedy ridges that are where you have to think in three dimensions here. There's a, probably a back side of this little um, nub of skin that's sticking up and those are reedy sticking straight into, uh, from the back side of this piece of skin. These are reedy that are being cut at a funny angle, tangentially cut, okay? So when you're tangential cutting of um, the reedy, they look like they're little islands in the dermis, okay? 
And that's actually important, especially when we start talking about melanomas, because sometimes you can mistake nests that are attached, uh, nests of in situ melanoma that are inside um, these reedy ridges, and you can think that they're dermal invasion if it's cut funny. So you gotta be careful about that. The other thing about tangential cutting is that it makes the, um, the junctional component look busier than it is. It makes it look like there are more cells because you're seeing more surface area of the basal layer than you're used to seeing. And so if you have a tangentially sectioned nevus, it can really look kind of weird and wild in the areas of tangential sectioning. And how do you know if it's tangentially sectioned? The best way, and it was actually some derm residents during my fellowship at Emory, the derm residents talked me this because as a pathologist you just kind of intuitively learn oh that looks tangential and I had never stopped to think of how to explain that and I thought this is the best explanation the papillary dermis looks like little entrapped islands completely surrounded by keratinocytes so the papillary dermis connects down to the rest of the dermis always so whenever we see uh, little islands of dermal papillae that are completely encircled by reedy ridge that means that we're cutting at an angle rather than straight down through the skin we're kind of cutting at an angle and in those areas you have to be a little bit more cautious to not over interpret the features in the epidermis um, as being you know too cellular or too many or, or confluent or pagetoid because the architecture is going to look a little different so learn to recognize tangential sectioning in nevi and don't over interpret that but in any case most of this lesion is in the dermis there are a few nests in the epidermis and also some single cells here here's a tiny little nest of melanocytes here and there are a couple of single cells and look the single cells are kind of large and have a prominent nucleolus, or maybe not prominent, but an, uh, an identifiable nucleolus. And I find that in big congenital nevi, these big thick ones like this, oftentimes you'll have kind of large epithelioid single melanocytes in the epidermis over top of them, and they're evenly scattered and spaced out from each other. See, there's like one here, and then all the way around there's another one, and then you go another six or seven or eight keratinocytes, there's another. So they're evenly spaced out. So I used to, I remember in training, I used to get real worried about those, and now I see them all the time. So don't worry, don't be afraid, that's benign, okay? Now look what we have, we have good maturation. Even though there's not nesting up here in the superficial aspect of the lesion, what we do have are large epithelioid melanocytes that have round oval nuclei, the nucleoli kind of stand out. There's a lot of cytoplasm. They're kind of arranged in a little bit of a sheet here, but they, they disperse as we go deeper. Look what happens. First, they get smaller and smaller and smaller. So they've kind of transitioned from type A towards type B, the small like kind of lymphocyte-like melanocytes. And then you can see that at the bottom, they start to trickle out as single cells in between the collagen. And they even start to get a little bit, a little bit wavy and spindly and neural looking as we go down here deeper in the dermis. Oh, sorry, that's not on the screen. <clears throat> as we go deeper in the dermis, they get more spindled and kind of neurotized. So type C melanocytes. Uh-oh, what about this? What's this structure? Ooh, it's a nerve. We have a nerve and a vessel, and here we have melanocytes tracking around this nerve. Now, should we be worried that this is perineural invasion and this is a melanoma? No, no, no. Oh, look, here's another one. Here's a little nerve right here, a tiny little nerve bundle completely surrounded and wrapped by melanocytes. This is a totally benign and normal finding. Yes, melanomas can invade around nerves, but benign nevi are often present around nerves. I do not call this perineural invasion. I don't even mention this in my report unless someone sent the case to me in consult and asked, what does this mean? There's a nerve involved. Benign nevi, particularly congenital pattern ones, often wrap around blood vessels and wrap around nerves. That's totally normal. And that's the way I conceptualize that is that this, these melanocytes grew up in the epidermis as the, as the fetus developed in utero. And so these melanocytes are wrapped around all of the normal um, uh, dermal structures. They're around the nerves, around the vessels. Sometimes little nodules of them can push into the vessel lumen and look like they're invading a vessel. Don't overinterpret those things or think that they mean that the lesion's malignant. Those are not features of malignancy. In fact, I see perineural involvement like this way, way more often in benign nevi than in melanomas. Mel again, melanomas can involve nerves, but that's not how you decide if it's a melanoma or not. You don't look and say, oh, there's nerve involvement, it's melanoma. No, 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 do not do that, that's dangerous. All right, and then look here. I told you also, see the, the eccrine coil, or excuse me, the eccrine duct. You can see the, this is an eccrine duct here. Here's one cut of it and here's another. And the melanocytes are wrapping along and tracking down along the eccrine duct. It's another feature of 
of a congenital pattern nevi. And here is a hair follicle and sebaceous glands. Sorry, let me get the light right. And you can see that it's a big follicle and the melanocytes are streaming and following it down into the dermis, wrapping around it. Sometimes you can even see uh, nests of melanocytes in the, the deep parts of the hair follicle and in the sebaceous glands in congenital nevi, okay? Oftentimes it's in the dermis around it, but I definitely see cases where there are, are significant nesting of melanocytes even within the sebaceous gland, okay? So again, another feature of congenital nevus. And there's another nerve that's wrapped around by melanocytes, a nerve and a vessel. Nerves and vessels tend to run together and melanocytes like to wrap around them. And the melanocytes trickling out and dispersing into the dermis. See how they're trickling out as single cells in between dermal collagen? That's a feature of normal nevi. So all of these features in this congenital nevus are all benign features, okay? There's maturation, and then there's tracking along all of these different dermal structures, which goes along nicely with a benign nevus that's probably uh, congenital and has been present since the patient was born. All right? So that's a good example of a congenital pattern nevus. Here's another one from low power. Again, look, the seborrheic keratosis-like changes to the surface. And even from low power, you can see it's, it's wrapping around follicles. Here's another deeper follicle here, and you can see melanocytes present around it. Going to higher power, you can see that you've got larger round type A melanocytes in the superficial dermis. And as we go deeper, they get smaller, have smaller nuclei. They tend to make kind of little cords and chains that trickle out into the dermis. Normal maturation pattern, okay? See little round cells trickling out. Again, epithelial cells are not supposed to grow like this. We would get really worried if we saw that. But in melanocytes, this is a nice reassuring feature. Now, melanomas can arise in nevi, I should point that out. And, and I, in fact, I see them arise in big, you know, in congenital nevi, it, usually in adults, it, in young kids with really large congenital nevi, occasionally you can have melanoma develop there, and that's a really difficult scenario that's outside the scope of this video. Um, but I see them arise in nevi in adults. Now, most nevi, the vast majority of nevi, will not ever transform to melanoma, but melanomas can sometimes arise in nevi or arise right next door to nevus. So just because there's benign features like this doesn't mean that the entire lesion has to be benign. There could be melanoma up top, and you've got to evaluate it using all the other features that we talked about, okay? See, this one actually is almost all in the dermis. It's an intradermal nevus with almost no or no junctional component really that I can see yet, all right? So um, again, but I, when I see this, though, this helps reassure me that at least this dermal part of the lesion that I'm looking at, at least this is a benign nevus, okay? And look, I wanna point out something else that happens, and we don't see it uh, that off. Well, I mean, I see it from time to time, but it, it's not as common as the other things, but look at these. These are not nerves, these are erector pili. Okay, they're muscles, smooth muscle bundles, and look what the nevus cells are doing. They're, quote, invading, not really, they're, they're trickling into and involving the erector pili muscles. Here's another erector pili muscle. Here's another one that's almost completely overrun by melanocytes. And I love when I see this, this is, to me, like this is one of the most helpful features for deciding if something is truly a congenital nevus because the melanocytes will get trapped up in the erector pili, okay? And that's a totally normal finding for uh, congenital nevi, right? I have rarely seen melanoma mimic that pattern, but not very often. And then another thing I'll point out over here is this. From lower power, you might see these big hyperchromatic guys and say, look at that, that's pleomorphism. Look at these big ugly cells, way bigger than their neighbors, much darker. Well, before we get too worked up, let's go closer and see what's actually happening here. Because what we actually have, and it is a little hard to show on the screen, but let's see if I can get it to come through. Ah, these are multinucleated dermal melanocytes, a common feature, particularly in congenital type nevi. This is, not, this is not a single pleomorphic nucleus. It's a little hard on the screen to see, but there are actually different nuclear membranes here. This is four or five nuclei stacked or clustered together. And you can see more clearly here that there are multiple nuclei in this multinucleated melanocyte. And when you get cut at a funny angle, they overlap and they look a lot bigger and a lot darker than the rest of the melanocytes. So that's a common feature, totally benign. Do not overinterpret that as severe atypia, okay? Learn to recognize that 
in obvious benign nevi. This is why it's important to pay attention to all these details. When you know a lesion's benign, look at all the funny details because one day you're gonna be faced with a challenging lesion and try to decide, is this atypical enough? Is this melanoma? And recognizing, oh, I've seen that weird looking finding many times in benign lesions before. It helps you to know not to get too worried about certain things that otherwise would worry you. So this is a normal benign feature. Okay, so anyway, recognize that those those multinucleated cells um, can be seen in the dermis. Usually you can also sometimes see them in the junctional component of epidermal nevi. Do be careful though in old sun damaged skin, particularly on the head and neck, if you see multinucleated melanocytes in the junction in that setting, that's a worrisome sign for uh, the lentigo malignant type of melanoma. But outside of that setting, I see multinucleated melanocytes all the time and that's totally okay. And again, here when you have these obvious, obviously benign uh, nevis. Spend some time if you're if you're new to looking at melanocytic things. Spend some time looking at the cytologic details. Looking at the fact that these these can be pretty large nuclei, but they they're nice even fine chromatin, small nucleoli. Most of them have nice smooth nuclear contours. Some of them are a little irregular, and that's okay. So learn what the cytology can look like. Learn the range of the features that you can see when you have an obvious benign lesion. And again, that will help you to uh, know the range that benign things can take. You know and uh, to not overinterpret features in um, when you have a more atypical lesion, all right? So another example of a, of a benign nevus. And I briefly showed you this case earlier. That was a little bright, there we go. This looked kind of weird, right, compared to the other lesions. Oh, maybe I didn't show this one, I can't remember. This is a compound uh, nevus that the surface, again, has this kind of seborrheic keratosis-like look. And it has a little bit of single melanocytes and small nests in the junction, but most of the interesting thing here is the dermis. In the dermis, what we have is a kind of unusual pattern that we see sometimes in, again, usually in congenital type nevi, where the, um, the cells are either the small round type B uh, lymphocyte-looking melanocytes or they're spindled type C melanocytes and kind of neurotized looking. And here I think most of them are kind of spindly and they're arranged in this funny like lines that kind of are wavy with spaces in between. And that's an artifactual space, all of these. But this is kind of a, a neurotized nevus that looks like it's mostly the spindly type C, very small, bland, spindled melanocytes. And it's just kind of a funny pattern that if you've not seen it before, you might not recognize it first. But we see this a lot where the, the cells kind of make these little strings that have spaces in between. And this is a kind of a funny artifact that we think happens during processing. I'm not exactly sure why it happens and it only happens some of the time, but that's a, a totally normal benign uh, nevus right here that's probably congenital uh, pattern, I would suspect. And again, whether you recognize if it's congenital or not doesn't matter, <clears throat> uh, most of the time at least. Here's another unusual feature we can see in nevi. Here's a nevus, again, a big deep nevus, mostly intradermal, has good maturation from bigger cells up here, even without looking at high power at the cytology. Larger up here with more cytoplasm and they get more blue and small as we go deep. You can see the color changes, right? They're more pale here because they have more cytoplasm. They're type A melanocytes. Going down here, they look small and blue like, like lymphocytes would. And so these are the type B melanocytes. And look at all this fat. We're in the dermis, we're not in the subcutis. But some nevi develop or grow fat. And sometimes the fat can be really abundant. And I've, I'm not exactly sure again why this happens. I've heard different theories. But there is benign fat can be present, kind of a fatty metaplasia, if you will, of, of normal mature fat in the middle of a nevus. So this doesn't mean anything just because you see fat there. It's a totally benign finding that we see on a regular basis. But it's an explanation for why you might have fat way up in the dermis if there's a nevus there, all right? Here is another nevus, uh, intradermal nevus. Tracks down deep around the adnexal structures. But what on earth is going on here? Is it a nevus plus like a hemangioma? Is it a vascular tumor here? Nope. But I do love to show this to uh, rotating medical students and junior residents and try to trick them into thinking this is a vascular tumor because it really does look like this kind of funny vascular channels lined by funny hobnailed looking um, endothelial cells. <clears throat> but it's actually not. This is a funny um, artifactual change that happens in some nevi, particularly big, thick, congenital nevi like this. 
And what this is, we call this pseudovascular change. The melanocytes kind of fall apart and leave these spaces, and the melanocytes that are left on the edges kind of bulge into the lumen and mimic the uh, mimic endothelial cells in a way. These are true vessels right here. Oh, you can't see that on the screen, sorry. I can see more on my microscope than you can see on the video screen. So there, that's a true vessel. That's a vessel right there. But all this stuff, this is all pseudovascular change in a benign nevus, okay? So this is, doesn't mean anything. I don't add any extra uh, in the diagnosis. I don't mention this. It's just, again, it's, these are just different patterns to recognize as pathologists to not be concerned by. Sometimes you can have hemorrhage in a, in a, during processing or after the biopsy and blood can kind of even fill into these spaces and really make it look like it might be um, uh, a, um, a vascular lesion. And again, looking from up here, we've got larger melanocytes, type A. They get smaller down here at the base. They get real small and almost spindly and start turning to type C melanocytes. So again, nice normal maturation in this nevus and a pseudovascular change. And uh, my colleague, Jennifer Cayley, uh, and I uh, published a little paper about this a couple of years ago. It's a well-recognized phenomenon, of course, uh, that's been known about for a long time, but it's still kind of cool and interesting. In some cases, it really can be dramatic. Here's another nice example of a congenital nevus. Beautifully, you can see from low power how the, the melanocytes track around the adnexa. And you might, some people have asked me, well, what's the difference between a melanocyte and a nevus cell and a nevomelanocyte? Well, a nevus cell or a nevomelanocyte is just the name applied to melanocytes that are part of a nevus. I, I find, that, so there's no distinction. These are melanocytes that just, if they're making a nevus, you can call them nevomelanocytes. I personally just think that's a little confusing. A lot of people do it, a lot of people much more experienced than me and expert than me use those terms, but I personally just say melanocytes. So whatever name you want to use is fine by me, uh, but I, I have had some people ask me and think that there's a difference, and to my knowledge, there is not. But you can see beautifully how there's tracking not only along hair follicles, but along the eccrine ducts, along the erector pili muscle. Where is it? Oh, and here, like, look, this is a nerve, and it's not just around the nerve, it's actually filling the perineurium, really wrapping around these nerve bundles right here, these three little uh, cuts of the same nerve. But again, this is definitely a benign nevus, and yet you can have really tight investment of nerves by nevus cells. This is totally normal for benign nevi. And again, remember, these cells arise from the, the same embryologic origin as the nerve cells do, right? The, ne the neural crest, the neuroectoderm. So it's to me not surprising to see, to see that happen. So a really good example. Somewhere there's an extra piece, okay. A really good example, again, of congenital features in an EVIS. And <clears throat> just a couple others before we finish up here. Uh, this is also a little bit older slide, but I think it demonstrates ni nicely. Look at the massive amount of epidermal growth and change that you can have over big congenital nevi. This is a congenital nevus in a child who is dark skinned. And again, like I told you earlier, sometimes nevi in dark skinned patients can get really abundant pigment. And the pigment can be both in the epidermis and in the dermis. And in this case, I told you earlier that most of the time when you see really pigmented um, dermal cells, they're gonna be melanophages, not melanocytes, but that's not always the case. And here's an example of an exception to that rule. You can see right over here, these cells are definitely melanocytes and that they're transitioning as they go up. And these are melanocytes too, right here. And as we move over, you can see them transition and develop all this pigment that fills up their cytoplasm. Now there are some things like uh, pigmented epithelioid melanocytoma, which has also been referred to as epithelioid blue nevus, or sometimes even animal type melanoma, which is a very controversial and confusing topic uh, that's beyond the scope of the basics video. But they will have big, round, darkly pigmented melanocytes, and so don't overinterpret the presence of hyperpigmentation of melanocytes, particularly in a congenital nevus in a dark skin patient, don't overinterpret that as meaning that this is some weird uh, variant of, of things like the, like the pigmented epithelial melanocytoma. I've seen people occasionally send cases like this in consult when there's heavy pigment in a nevus and they're worried that it's some rare entity and it's actually just dark pigment in a dark skinned patient. 
okay? And so that's the point about the pigment. And the other reason I wanted to show this lesion is look at how deep this goes. I can't even get the whole thing at low power. Here's the surface. Here's the dermis completely replaced by nevus, and look what happens. Down in the subcutis, in the subcutaneous septa, we have extension of the nevus. And that's something, again, I see usually in true, big congenital nevi in young kids, true congenital nevi, particularly the large ones, the giant congenital nevi, will tend to have this, they'll have spread. Usually the melanocytes get very spindly and type C and neurotized. See here, you got structures that look kind of Wagner-Meissner-like. They look like these swirled, rounded structures of spindled melanocytes. So they're making kind of these oval structures, but in the middle they look spindly. And they really resemble the Wagner-Meissner bodies we see in neurofibromas. They really can sometimes look almost like nerve twigs. I mean, these look almost like little nerves. And again, you can still see melanin pigment even down here. A lot of times you don't see much pigment in the deep aspect of a nevus, but here we do. And so again, we're way down in the subcutis, even at the very deep edge, and there's still nevus present. So particularly in large congenital nevi, we can see involvement of the subcutis, and it has this tendency to spread down the septa like that, like that, in between the fat lobules, a little bit over here. And it tends to look very neurotized when it does that. There's something on this slide I wanted to show. Again, and I know I'm showing a lot of congenital nevi, and that's because there's such a beautiful example of normal maturation. It's a great way to learn about maturation. And then from there, you can learn to apply it to, to other lesions. The th I, in my experience, the thicker a lesion is, the, the deeper into the dermis it goes, the more easy it is to look at maturation. When you have a nevus that only has a few dermal nests, well, it's really hard to assess if they mature or not because there's not much there to actually look at. So it's easier to show and teach maturation on these larger um, nevi. So here, look, there's big epithelial melanocytes making big nests. And particularly in young patients, I feel like the melanocytes can be even larger, even more epithelioid, have even larger nests. And um, in young patients, you can see that, okay? And look, this nest even has a cleft. It doesn't, this is a feature that we sometimes see in Spitz nevi, which we'll talk about in another video. But overall, this lesion doesn't look like a Spitz nevus. So I find that congenital nevi in young kids sometimes have some features that remind you of Spitz nevus, but overall are not. And I, I try to avoid making a diagnosis of Spitz nevus unless that's really what it is, because it tends to get people a little bit worked up because that name has been involved in some controversial and confusing uh, entities. And we'll, again, another video for that. And here, look, you've got, again, tracking around erector pili muscles, tracking around uh, eccrine ducts, all the features of a nice benign uh, congenital nevus. And a beautiful example, too, of how the melanocytes trickle out as little single cells in between the dermal collagen, a nice normal maturation pattern. And sometimes nevi can be I can't even fit it on the screen. So large and pedunculated, like here, look, here's where the skin, where the dermatologist biopsied it. But look, at we're gonna go around the whole thing. It's a big, huge polyp. And so it can really clinically resemble um, a skin tag or a neurofibroma, okay? And in fact, this one really looks like a neurofibroma in the middle of it, because this is the one I showed you earlier. This is the nevus that had a lot of neurotized features. It had spindled type C melanocytes and Wagner-Meissner bodies, or what look like Wagner-Meissner bodies. Again, these rounded structures of spindle cells. So how can you tell this apart? I mean, this really, you could show a picture of this and it really looks in some areas like identical to a neurofibroma. So how can you tell it apart? Well, for one thing, neurofibromas are benign. So most of the time, the distinction doesn't really matter clinically. If it's a benign neurofibroma, versus an intradermal nevus, a congenital neurotized looking intradermal nevus. They're both benign lesions, okay? But if you want to know, for one thing, you could do some melanocytic markers like MART1, uh, which should stain uh, at least uh, should stain the, uh, even neurotized nevi should stain with MART1, um, whereas neurofibromas will not, normal neurofibromas will not. But the easier way is look around a little bit. And most of the time, even strikingly neurotized nevi will have areas like this with round, um, obviously nevoid cells. These are clearly not <clears throat> neurofibroma cells. These are melanocytes making nests. These are um, um, nests of melanocytes. So usually, you, if you, especially if you go up near the epidermis, you will find at least some nesting and or some melanin production 
<clears throat> that will show you that you're dealing with a neurotized nevus rather than a neurofibroma. So you don't really need to do immunostains for these, I think, in, in most cases. Because again, it doesn't really have any clinical significance, but if you're curious, that's a way to do it. See, so here's some pigment, a few pigmented melanocytes. Here's some other melanocytes here. But then as you go deeper down or into the center of this polypoid lesion, it starts to look more and more neurotized. But almost always, I feel, if you look around, you'll find obvious, um, obvious melanocytes, even in very neurotized uh, nevi. So that's the end. I know it was a long video. If you've stuck through all the way to the end, um, a round of applause for you. I hope that you find this helpful in conceptualizing the basic features of benign nevi. Again, remember, symmetry, maturation, melanocytes that are oriented at the basal layer and lack pagetoid spread and lack confluent growth, bland cytology, that is lack of severe cytologic atypia, and low or no mitotic activity. Those to me are some of the core features I look for in deciding that something is a benign nevus rather than a melanoma. And again, I'll do another video, uh, hopefully in the near future, about the features of malignancy, the features that help me make a diagnosis of melanoma. Thank you for watching. Please like um, and subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet. And I would love to have comments from you down below uh, telling me what features and what things about the video are useful and uh, what things uh, you would like me to do more of in the future. Thanks so much for watching.